Namaste. I'm Reverend Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in beautiful San Diego. You know, we are always searching for ways to live the example of our teachings in order to improve our world. One of the ways we accomplish this is with Partners Fair Trade Boutique, our store here at the Unity Center campus. You'll find many unique items from around the world, all ethically sourced through fair trade. You know, we're exploring Jesus, meet the man. And I was thinking, what would it have been like to actually be with him? Not the him that we might have learned about in our church upbringing, but I'm talking about physically being with him when he, in human form, walked the planet. And I would imagine that for those that were with him and were paying attention to what it was he was teaching and saying, that I bet they could relate to that song. That they would feel, in the midst of these messages and these teachings and this consciousness of this man, I'm a new person. I think of the woman at the well. I think of the woman caught in adultery and, and in the process of perhaps being stoned to death. And Jesus says, you know, who is without sin casts the first stone at her? And everybody disperses. And, and he talks to her and he says, you know, where are your accusers? And, and I don't condemn you either. Go. Be a new person. Be a new person new person. That's really what spiritual teaching has the potential to do for us. It has the potential, if we practice it, for us to evolve and to really be transformed at depth, to be a new person. And I do believe that within the teachings of Jesus, that we have a path to higher consciousness. We have a path to becoming a new person. It's not the only path, and it's not the only teacher. But it is, he is, for many of us, most of us in this room, and even most of us in the New Thought teachings, he is the teacher that we are probably the most familiar with, the most familiar with. And so today, as we continue to meet the man and prep for Easter, I want to talk about a few key ideas in his teaching and message that opened the door to a new path to consciousness. But first I want to mention that where I'm pulling some of these ideas from are from authors like Bishop John Shelby Spong, who's written more than 20 books about understanding the Bible and understanding Jesus' teachings and, and talks about Jesus for the non-religious and rescuing the Bible from fundamentalism. He gives me a lot of inspiration and a lot of courage just from the titles of the books that he wrote. From our very own Eric Butterworth, no longer with us, but Eric Butterworth, Unity Minister, who wrote numerous books, one of them being Discover the Power Within You, which is a deep mystical and metaphysical look at Jesus' teachings, primarily focusing on his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. And then even from the work that I did years ago that turned into a, P a short PBS series with Deepak Chopra, when I interviewed him on his book, The Third Jesus, and, um, and we talked about what is that third Jesus? That's what we were looking at last week, that we have the historical Jesus, a man who walked the planet that we know very little bit about, very little about. We have the theological Jesus that many of us have run away from, the Jesus that we got in church. And we have the mystical Jesus or the metaphysical Jesus, that the Jesus that we're going to talk about today that really opened a path to higher consciousness. But even the word Jesus can be charged for some of us. And I'm so grateful that one of our members last week when he came through the line said to me, do you think you'll say anything about the fact that Jesus' name wasn't really Jesus, it was Yeshua? And this person in our church shared with me that at one time, and maybe even still, the word Jesus is a bit of a trigger. A trigger for anybody else in this room? You know, I got to thinking about it because I talked to you about how God, the word God was a trigger for me even in ministerial school. Because of the God I grew up with, the concept of God that was presented to me in my um, faith tradition was scary. You had to kind of win this God over, right? That this God, you know, was, could be great, but could also be pretty bad. And so, um, you know, I had some challenges with the God word for the longest time. But why I never really thought about the J word, the Jesus word, you know, for, for uh, any number of people 
It can be a highly charged word. And again, not so much because of who and what he was, but who and what has been done around him. Like that quote that says, I like the man. I'm just not so crazy about his fan club. You know, we like the man, but not so crazy about his fan club. His name wasn't Jesus. His name was Yeshua. You see, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and in Aramaic, the New Testament in Greek. And there was a problem in translating the name Yeshua from the Hebrew into the Greek because the Greeks didn't have a letter or the sound of S-H. So instead of it being Yeshua, it became Yesua. And over time, the last part of the vowel, the ending, was dropped. And over, it was found in the 16th century, that the Y sound started to sound more like a J, and we get Jesus. So a whole kind of journey. So if the word Jesus, and you can even hear it, Jesus, you know, how I can, can't believe I said that, <laughs> is triggering. I mean, it's a trigger for me. That's not the Jesus I relate to. But Yeshua, right? Okay, so now I know. We got, we got triggers in this room, right? And so, unfortunately, too many of us have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. But when we get, get to the teaching, or try to get to the teaching, we can get to something that helps us to really be that new person. That new person. Eric Butterworth, in his book, to Discover the Power Within You, talks about what we've done to this concept of Jesus and the teachings. And he uses a metaphor of a stained glass window. I'm going to take the time to read it to you. It's a little bit long, but I want to read it to you because it really, to me, describes what we've done that has become a disservice to what the actual teaching is and kind of why and how it happens or happened. He writes, in a way, Jesus created a great picture window through which man can view the vast and beautiful panorama of the spiritual dimension of life. When he said, come unto me, he was inviting his disciples of all times to come and sit with him and view the infinite reality of things from the perspective he had found to view the infinite reality of things from the perspective he had found. His finger is pointing out through the window, not at himself. Don't look at me, he is saying, but look to the Spirit as I am looking to the Spirit. Look to the Spirit, look to God as I am looking. See yourself in the light of the Christ as I have seen myself in this light. Believe on me and the actual demonstrations of the divinity of man, which I have made, and realize what this really means, that you have the same potential within you. Whatever I have done, you can do. I have created the window. Let us look through it together. Never forget this window, for it is your inlet and outlet to all there is in God. The window is something to be seen through, not to be looked at. To be seen through, not to be looked at. The disciples were slow to comprehend, but most of them did eventually see the picture. They, in turn, gathered other disciples who came to the window to see through to the ultimate reality of the unity with God. Generations passed. The contagious influence of Jesus' initial discovery slowly faded. Oh, people still came to the window, but in time, it was a ritual of worship. A few still looked through the window, but the majority simply stared at the window in all its austerity. In time, the window became old, dusty, and opaque. Now almost no one sees through the window. It is the object instead of the medium. It is adorned with gold and gems. It is made into an altar. It is a focal point of worship. Millions upon millions of devotees through the ages have come and knelt before this window, but only occasionally 
does a clear-minded thinker come to clean the darkened glass and to see through the window? It is still there, and the great discovery made by Jesus is still as relevant to the life of the individual as it was 2,000 years ago. When I think of unity, I think of ourselves as being in practice as ones that would have sat by his side and attempted to look through the same window that he was looking through, that would have attempted to try to understand the infinite reality that he was pointing to, that we would have looked with him at a new understanding of God, that we would have realized that whatever he said about himself, he was also saying about us. You know, the church has tended to emphasize the divinity of Jesus, and yet Jesus emphasized the divinity of all of us, of all of us. He made the bold claim that if you believe on me, believe on the teachings, you will do the same things that I have done. That's a pretty bold statement. And so I think that perhaps one of the greatest discoveries that he made was the discovery of the spiritual dimension of life, and that is available to all of us. The discovery of the spiritual dimension of life, and that is available to all of us. And that when we understand the spiritual dimension of life, we begin to transform the human experience of our life. And so I want to touch upon three key ideas. They're not the only ideas to the path of conscious, God consciousness that Jesus presents, but here are three that I want to share with you. And the first is the idea that he spoke about, the idea of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And when he talked about it, he said, it doesn't come with observation. You don't, you're not going to point and say, it's over there, it's over there, it's over there. For the kingdom of heaven is within you. He didn't say the kingdom of heaven is only within me. He said the kingdom of heaven doesn't come with observation, at least not external observation. The kingdom of heaven is within you, within you. You know, what's interesting is no matter what version of Jesus a person follows, no matter what version of they, they follow, they tend to, to look at heaven as the ultimate prize, right? The ultimate prize, and, yet, and heaven as a place to get to. And yet Jesus spoke of a different concept, not a place to get to, but an experience within, an experience within. I'm reminded of a little book by one of our Unity ministers written many years ago. It's a great little book. I don't know if it's still in print. It was written by Bill Fisher, and the book is, the title of it is Alternatives. And in Alternatives, Bill writes about many of the church concepts that most of us have grown up with, heaven and hell and the whole, the whole gamut, what is baptism, what is communion, all of that. And he writes about it in a very simple way of here's what we, how we see it in, mis, in mysticism, in metaphysics, in unity. And he writes about growing up in a, in a mainline church and how the concept of heaven was really appealing to him, like this wonderful, fantastic place. The only problem was you had to be old and die to get there. You know, and, and so for many people, they have that kind of concept, right? But, but there's so much in the Gospels and so much in Jesus' teaching that points to it's not a place, but it's a state of awareness. It's a state of consciousness. The very word heaven comes from the Greek word aranos. I think I'm saying it right. And aranos conveys the idea of expansion, expansion. And what expands the most, really, when you think about it, is consciousness. It's consciousness. The different inner reality that Jesus points to, that he calls the kingdom of heaven. So when he's speaking about the kingdom of heaven and it being within you, he's pointing to a different inner reality. And he's pointing to an inner reality that is accessible to every single one of us but it's accessible through the path of meditation, of reflection. It's accessible to us through the practice 
of reflection and meditation. Within each of us, there are essentially three selves. Have you ever thought you were kind of nuts inside? There's a reason for it. There's three of us in there, at least three. There's the mental us, there's the physical us, and there's what we would call, or what's called in spiritual practice, the witness or the observer. And it is when, and prayer and meditation are the the best ways I know to get into the experience of the observer, when we get into the experience of the observer, we move beyond the confines of ourselves as a mental being, and we move beyond the confines of ourselves as a physical being. And we begin to get in touch with ourselves as an infinite, eternal, spiritual being. And it is from that place, it is from that awareness, even if we only touch that momentarily, that we begin to find a clearer path in living our human life. We begin to be informed in better ways of being, in better ways of doing. A ministerial friend and colleague of mine shared this idea with me. It's a twist on a statement many of us in this room have have heard before and have used before, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. My friend said to me, no, I don't think that's quite right. I think we are spiritual beings having a spiritual experience in a human body. We are spiritual beings having a deeply spiritual experience in human bodies. And so when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven doesn't come with observation, for lo, it is within you. He is pointing us to a different inner dimension. The Buddha did the same thing in a different way. I believe every spiritual master teacher is pointing to this same inner dimension and saying to us as human beings, until we embrace and understand that real, most real part of ourselves, we are going to experience unnecessary strife and trouble and struggling. A second key concept I think of Jesus, and you know, I have to pause here for a moment because these in a way are not new ideas to us, right? We have all sorts of teachers today writing about these ideas, but try to put yourself in the place 2,000 years ago. These were radical teachings and ideas then because it wasn't about spiritual practice. It was about the letter of the Mosaic law, at least in Judaism. It was about a very dogmatic, ritualistic religion And so when Jesus is speaking about things like the kingdom of heaven being within you and is speaking about God calling God Abba, meaning Father, close, intimate, he is challenging the concept that the very people he was talking to were inculcated in. He's saying, no, there's something different. There's something more than what you've been led to believe. Second key concept is the idea of being born anew. If we hear it as born again, we might feel just as triggered as Jesus, right? You know, it's like those two go together. We just don't, we don't like that. And that's why I think so many people are just leaving, leaving church. And yet, this idea that Jesus talked about, about being born anew, is the idea of personal transformation, not in a distant time, but right here, right now. To be born anew in the way that we think, to be born anew in the way that we understand ourselves to be and to understand our relationship with the infinite. When we get that, we are very literally transformed. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so the the emphasis is not so much on an outer transformation, but an inner transformation. And it takes effort. It takes effort. It takes practice. It takes stepping out of our usual ways of thinking and being. 
Years ago, I remember a neighbor of ours. What's the word I'm looking for? Putting a very negative spin on unity, saying that it is the feel-good religion. She grew up Catholic, and so a lot of guilt there. And so in comparison, her perception of unity was, oh, it's just the feel-good religion. And I thought to myself, when I got past feeling defensive and angry about that, I thought to myself, well, yes, there are times we feel good. There's something wrong with that. But, but it is so much more than that. Because these, teaching re- re- these teachings require consistent practice, do they not? Consistent practice. And they don't rest on coming into a place like this once a week and saying some words and then leaving. They rest upon what do we do in our day-to-day lives. How are we thinking? How are we treating one another? How are we living? What are the choices that we are, are making? Anything but the easy path. It is a consistent and steady path, but it is a path that leads to awakening and leads to a true and deep and lasting transformation from the inside out. And when that happens, or even begins to happen, then we begin to, not, to expand our circle of care and caring. And it very naturally and, and effortlessly really evolves beyond just how am I living my life for myself, but how am I living my life in a way that is making a difference to others? That is really about the second part of what we say is our mission in unity, right? Healing our world. So being born anew is to be actively engaged in your own spiritual transformation. And it does not happen by simply saying something like, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, and therefore it's done. Boy, I wish it were easy like that. Don't you? Wouldn't that be a lot easier than the dailiness of it? Am I the only one that feels that way? (laughs) It's about taking up the practice. It's about taking up the practice. That's how we are born anew. And then the third concept I want to share from him is a concept when he speaks to the idea of being in the world, but not of the world. Being in the world, but not of the world. I think the hardest place to deeply practice one's spiritual teachings is in the laboratory of an ordinary life. It is pretty easy, I think, or easier, to practice these deeper spiritual teachings if you live all by yourself on a mountaintop. You don't have to deal with exes, traffic, finances, all the nitty-gritty, right? All the nitty-gritty. When Jesus talks about being in the world, but not of the world, what I get from that is such comfort and validation that, yes, we are living in a human experience, and that experience comes with certain responsibilities and demands and limitations and all and stuff. but that's not all there is. I am in the world, but I am not of the world. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. You are more than that. You always have been, even if you haven't known it, and you always will be. And so when you find yourself in the thick of your life, where things maybe are frightening or chaotic or difficult, or you look out at the world and there are things you see that you don't like, you don't pull away and ignore it. You do what you can do because you're in the world. But at the same time, at the same time, you remember that you are not of it, that you are of something eternal. 
You are of something infinite. It, to me, is a bit of... To me, it's connected a bit with the idea and some of the Eastern teachings of non-attachment or detachment, where we can be operating in and through our lives, dealing with whatever we need to deal with, but also being able to hold it all lightly, to be able to be detached from it, not meaning that we don't care and not meaning passive, but we're not hooked. Can you get a sense of the difference of that? Right? You know when you're hooked, don't you? I know when I'm hooked, right? And the difference between being able to say, I am in this, but I am not of this. I am in this, but there is that in me that is beyond this, and it is that in me that is beyond this that will carry me through it to the other side. I hope that as you have listened in today that there has been at least one or two ideas that have just kind of stuck inside of you where you can say to yourself, you know, I'm going to work with that. You know, I think that's going to be helpful in this area of my life. Because I believe that what part of what my job is, any minister or te- spiritual teacher's job is, is to throw out concepts and ideas and then to trust the process that as you are listening, your own deeper wisdom is going to grab and say, this is where you should practice. And when we each do that, then I think we're doing our spiritual homework. And we will grow together. We will transform our own individual lives. That's a continuous process. And we will be about helping to co-create a more loving, more just, more peaceful world for all, leaving no one and nothing behind. Namaste.